The National Festival of Australian Theatre begins on Friday and continues until October the 21st, and that's, of course, in Canberra. And now to our sculptor, Deborah Halpin. She took a mighty risk when she accepted a commission from the National Gallery of Victoria in the late 80s. Asked for an icon to stand in the moat at the gallery, the young ceramic artist produced Angel, the 30-foot-high, three-legged angel. Deborah Halpin had no formal art school training, but armed with talent, a taste for parody, and inspired by the outsider artists of Europe, she created a gorgeous creature that has almost become a Melbourne personality. When I first received the letter from the National Gallery asking me to consider the job for the sculpture in the moat, my first reaction was amazement and incredulity. I'd never done anything like that before and in fact my deepest reaction was one of fear. At first she didn't have a name, the angel sculpture, and she didn't have a sex either. In fact she was sort of anonymous and unidentified and then as time went on in the process of making I found on the floor a piece of newspaper which had a heading on it God and the Angel and I knew at that moment that her name was Angel and all sorts of things fell into place from that moment on I grew up in Warrandyte, and both of my parents were potters. All of my parents' peers were artists, sculptors, potters, painters. However, uh, being the child that I was, I didn't want to be an artist in that way. So I thought, well, I'll be a writer. So I went to university, and I thought, right, this is what you do when you're a writer. And then I realised that that was nothing to do with writing. So I dropped out of university and I had no way of making a living. So my mother said to me, why don't you be in an exhibition that I'm about to have? So it would have been a two-hander, my mother and myself. And this work began to flow from me. That was so bizarre. It was bizarre to me because I, I didn't know where it was coming from. It was coming from some unknown secret place. I didn't know how people were going to react to it. I mean, they could have said, God, that is hideous work. And, you know, that, would have, that probably would have been the, the end of my ceramics career at that point. But luckily they didn't. In fact, the response was so overwhelmingly good that it shocked me. Deborah's work, very simply, was a, a, re a revelation at the time. One had been absolutely used to and attuned to what was called the Anglo-Oriental tradition. Uh, of ceramics. Uh, it was based on basically stoneware ceramics, very dark, beautiful, sensitive vessel forms, granular surfaces, parched surfaces. It was certainly an Asian contemplative aesthetic, uh, very beautiful. And then in the midst of all of this, and Australia had a very strong tradition of stoneware ceramics in this Anglo-Oriental tradition as we might describe it, in the midst of this comes along Deborah Halpin and a number of other people working in a similar vein with these great shiny, brightly glazed, colourful, Thurberesque uh, figures with these cyclops heads and dangling arms, seeming to be irreverent, seeming to be provocative, but seeming also to be full of life and full of mythology and full of illusion, literary illusion, and certainly uh, something other than the mainstream that one had been used to. So quite a revelation, and this, this needed looking at very closely. By the time she had um, shown some works in another exhibition, called Sheer Madness at the, the old Griffin Gallery, she hit upon the idea of making a series of forms like cotton reels and simply threading them on a, um, on a steel rod. So from that time on, 
there was no limit to the size. And I think then she started to, to grow and to become more sculptural. Once upon a time, I read a story about a woman who had scraps of paper in her pocket with drawings of ideas on them. And she used to show these drawings to friends of hers and they'd say, oh, look, they're very nice. Uh, put them back in your pocket because you're not going to do anything about those. So she, she kept showing people and one day she showed them to the sculptor Jean Tangli. And he said, these are fantastic. Why don't you do something about them? And she said, well, I, I can't. I wouldn't know how to anyway. And he said, look, the vision is the thing that matters. The technical stuff follows second. And that woman's name was Nikki de Saint-Fal, and she is one of the most important influences in my life. And some time later, she left her husband and she left her kids, and she did follow her vision. And I think one of the most important things that somebody could tell you in your life is to follow your vision. is the work of Monsieur Chatelaine and he lives in what I call the deep countryside of France and his garden is full of the most marvellous creatures. Now most people, you know, in my brain, most normal people in inverted commas have, you know, an eagle or a lion on their front post or he has a chook. <laughs> I went to Europe to find these outsider artists. So I had some sort of idea in my mind. I, I, something had got me there to look for them. Um, I'd seen the work in books, and and some for some reason I needed to see it, you know, in the flesh. Um, one of the things that interested me was that I didn't know where to, to start. I didn't know where the trail began, the outsider trail. Uh, so I went to the uh, Pompidou Centre bookshop <laughs> and they didn't know anything about it. It was just not in their consciousness and it became very apparent to me that outsider, art brute, whatever you want to call it, exists right outside of what places like the Pompidou Centre think of as art. This is the work of Alain Bourbonnais himself, and his work is it's slightly more sophisticated. So I put this one in. I actually don't even like this one. I find it really gross. But when I look at it, you know, the, the tin can lid for an eye, the, the duck's feet around the eye, the women's shoes for the beak, it's, it's macabre, and it's just its stream of consciousness. I can't put it in any other way. Some of the work was dreadful. It was not, you know, here's a value judgment for you. It was not even good and interesting outsider art. It was just this mad outflowing from somebody. And often when it was a mad outflowing, they thought it was the most incredible thing anybody could ever witness. So, but it was the intention and it was of the, of the creator, of the person. It's a door into a world that is available to all of us because the outsider artists are not artists with a capital A, and nor do they make art with a capital A. They probably don't even think about it, but they make things. They fulfill their dreams, they realise their visions. And whether they're a postman or a railway yard person or, or a secretary or an engineer, it, it doesn't matter. That's got nothing to do with what they make. It's to do with their vision and it's to do with their willingness to fulfill that vision. I witnessed, I witnessed something essential 
that still touches me enormously. And I, you know, I'll touch on it every now and again. And I'll open my books on Art Brute. And I get so excited and so overwhelmed. I have to close them because I'm just, it's too exciting. You know, it's like, I can't look at that. It's just overwhelmingly marvelous. And you know, then I'll go and do something else, like gardening or something. So it's, you know, this is, this is big stuff, big stuff, in an, on an intimate level. When the Angel project came along, I had to make a leap, a technical leap, but it was more a leap in faith because I actually had no uh, evidence that I could do this thing. It was just because I said so. So I started investigating the technique that I believed I was going to use. And that was through conversations, after conversations with my engineer, but also the technique was not, it's not unusual in the world, but I had never used it before. So that was using steel, concrete, and I suppose that's called ferro-cement, with tiles on top of it. Once I had the evidence that I could actually do this by myself, then I saw that it was possible to make Angel. If you look at most of the work of Deborah Halpin, the thing which is fascinating is that it's so spontaneous and intuitive. Now, you can be spontaneous and intuitive on a small scale. You can handle clay quickly and freely. But if you're doing a public commission, something of quite gigantic scale, then you're forced to, uh, to plan very, very carefully ahead. Not only for the artist to plan ahead, but quite obviously she had to bring in a whole host of consultants that had to be engineers and fabricators who had to test the structure and, um, and guarantee that the thing would, would withstand the winds, for instance. I had to talk to a man about the fact that it wasn't stainless steel, it was mild steel and you couldn't sandblast such a big piece. There wasn't a galvanising bath in Melbourne big enough to dip such a huge armature. So we had to find a way around that. We had to find solutions. The group of people that I worked with and myself had never actually had experience in this field before. In as much as a project of this nature had never been, didn't exist in the world as far as I knew. Not precisely this nature. So there were no people we could go to to talk. There were no books that one could read to study the technique. So we had to invent it as we went along.
the team was actually getting bigger and bigger. The dock workers had come in and they'd lend us equipment if they weren't using it. They'd lend us cherry pickers, which was marvellous. In fact, we housed their cherry picker and used it while they weren't using it. We kept it in good shape and the battery charged up, so that was reciprocal. Then the reps would come in, all the ones who were involved in the project. How's it going? You know, how's our... Uh, we had special grouts made, coloured grouts. And the, the rep was so excited about these colours that had been made up specially for the job. He came in with the bags and he tore them all over and said, look at this red, have you ever seen red grout? He was excited. He was involved. So it was a nice, it was a rich environment. It was a very warm and supportive environment. There were a whole host of people working there. The skeleton structure had been covered in the cement, the ferro cement, and she had uh, a mass production underway of um, painting the tiles and then firing them and then cutting them up. And then, of course, it was quite a skilled and difficult task of plying those to the surface because a, a square flat tile doesn't very easily wrap around um, an odd three-legged beastie. So there was a lot of cutting of the uh, tiles to make them fit. So that again was technically a very difficult problem because the, the pattern had to be exactly as she wanted it on the surface and yet the tiles had to be repeatedly cut to fit on this quite difficult complex surface. I think and it's slightly unnerving to look back on this aspect of it, but this work was her apprenticeship piece. Uh, I mean, her apprenticeship and this major public work were one and the same uh, uh, moment. I suppose one of the extraordinary things about Angel was the fact that he was a, quite a young and relatively inexperienced sculptor come ceramicist who was confronted with a huge commission now, the sad thing is that most of the sculptors in Australia have had little experience with public commissions because there haven't been many. The old idea of apprenticeship in which uh, an artist might have worked with an older sculptor and picked up a lot of the skills, that sort of dropped out of favour. So there are, there are a whole range of things which a young artist just doesn't know. I think Deborah Halpin had to pick up and go out and find money and find sponsorship before the work could actually be completed because I think the original budget was something like 25000 which is ludicrously low in terms of the final piece of sculpture. I don't know what the final budget would have been but I think it would have been 125 or 150000 um, for such a work. It always began as quite a monumental um, effigy in the moat there, but it became a considerably more monumental effigy uh, than we had all thought. Monumental in terms of time and cost as well as, uh, as, well as look. Well, part of the process I discovered was that I would have to go out and raise sponsorship. Now, I'd never done that before. And my preconceived idea about business people is that there they are, they're in their offices, they're not interested at all in the art world or in playing with, with things creative. But what I noticed was that when I went and, and asked people if they wanted to donate concrete or things to do with welding, was it more often than not the answer was yes. And they came in to view this sculpture, their sculpture, as if it was, uh, it, they were connected to it which they were. they were. They were partly responsible for her coming into being because if we hadn't got that sponsorship, it wouldn't have been made. The studio at Port Melbourne was always a hive of activity. Although it was undercover, it always reminded me of those um, early photographs of the Statue of Liberty um, being built in Paris with its scaffolding around it and then these uh, Lilliputian figures uh, all over it, clamouring over it, um, a, a bustle of activity below, people in back rooms doing things, others boiling up coffee, others making cookies, others glazing tiles. Uh, it was a, a wonderland in a sense. Um, if we hadn't all been so concerned with time 
timelines and budget and engineering factors, uh, one could have actually settled back and enjoyed it more than one did at the time. From the Angel project, I've gone on to make other public sculptures. One is Ophelia at Southgate, and this is a sculpture that lives on the riverbank and watches over the river and is there day and night with the people who come and go. She has cups of coffee with people. And from the Ophelia sculpture has come another commission, which is three works that stand uh, in High Point. It's a shopping centre, shopping mall, and the people there may not notice these works or they may notice them but kids will rack it around and people will be shopping and people will be having sandwiches and those works will be living there with them so the challenge in making angel and these later works has been to successfully relate the things i make to the people who view them looking at the art that existed in around melbourne at that time you know, which is what, 85, something like that, was it, most of it was inaccessible, even to me, who, this was my life. I, I worked with art, this is what I did, this is what I supposedly thought about all the time. I didn't, I didn't connect with these works. I didn't know how to approach them. I didn't have the language. Never having been to art school and studied the language, the insider language of art, you know, the secret, the secrets in a way. It's like an esoteric thing. Um, I felt very disconnected from these works. So my intention for Angel was to make a work to which people could connect. And it didn't, I didn't care whether these were people who knew all about the art world and lived within it. People who were the curators who were working inside the gallery, who obviously had a, you know, knew the secret language or whether they were people who were walking down St Kilda Road who never went into the gallery. Well, I go past here every, almost every day. I think it's quite nice, quite, quite unique. It's a mosaic, uh, you know. The sculpture that we're seeing here in front of the building is quite amazing. The colours are terrific. I must say, we're from the US and we don't understand the symbolism here, but it's very, very interesting. It must surely, um, alongside the fairy penguins, be one of the most photographed um, destinations in, in, this, in the state. Colour, texture, it's really earthy and vibrant. I've always, it's just sort of, I think it's perfect. 